start your Sunday morning. So on behalf of all of us here at Spirit of God Fellowship, I want to welcome everyone here today. Uh, we are so excited. Every chance we get to come together and worship Jesus Christ and uh, just pour out our hearts before him in the same spirit he's, he's poured his life out on us. So this is a good day. This is a really good day today. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, one being this, we, we won't all be there. We can't all be at the campster pool after church. Uh, so this isn't an invitation to, to you guys. Uh, but some people are getting baptized. So in advance, we're just excited about the fact that several people are being baptized today. And uh, we'll celebrate that, celebrate their new life, celebrate their commitment to Jesus Christ. So that's one big deal that's going to happen today. 
a couple of other things that are coming up. Women's Bible study books are in. So you want to see Nicole McPherson for your books if you ordered those. Well, if you ordered those, you know who you are. Uh, and lesson one is due Tuesday, October 6th at 9.30 p.m. A.M. Is that right? Okay. That was like late dropping news. And um, remember we said next Sunday we're going to start off our Sunday morning live service. First Sunday of every month. And we're going to be led by lit leaders in training, our young adults. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. So please, please come out. Show up for that. Um, make a note of that on your calendar. And excuse me for the technical difficulties here. But today's service, this, today's service is for everyone who wasn't absolutely perfect this past week. Yeah, we all get in. We all get in. If you weren't absolutely perfect this week, this service is made for you. There's freedom in the house. You can celebrate your life. You can call on Jesus Christ. You can be in his presence. All of that for free, for nothing, for you just coming and believing that Jesus loves you and is, that he's here for you. So we want to spend this next period of time just letting Jesus Christ know how much we love him, how much we appreciate him and what he's done for us.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, team. Wow. Some of us are, the thing I love about this church is we're all at different places in life and different faith levels. We, you don't know who you may be sitting next to this morning. We all come from different places. But so, so maybe you're sitting here saying, 
what's all that hallelujah, hallelujah, what, what in the world are we talking about here? Well, hallelujah is the one word in the English language or in language that is, is translated the same in all languages. It means celebrate, celebrate. How many of us can agree that he deserves our praise? And we celebrate by saying hallelujah. That's what we were doing this morning. That's what we were doing. Well, good morning, Spirit of God Fellowship. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming to church this morning. It's so good to see more and more and more people coming to church. There's no substitute for being together. It's good to be together. I'm telling you, I say this every morning, from 10 o'clock till 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, it's my favorite hour of the week. President George W. Bush was elected president Tuesday, November 7th, in the year 2000. It was the most controversial election we have ever had in the United States. George Bush, Al Gore, the Democratic candidate, and all of America waited for over a month, remember? to see who our president would be. And then the Supreme Court decided the election on December the 12th. Our country was bitterly, bitterly divided. Many, many people called George Bush an illegitimate president. Then the day after the Supreme Court weighed in and the election for all practical purposes was over. Over a month later, Al Gore, the Democratic candidate who fought a, a, a big battle to be president, he conceded on national television. I want you to listen to his concession speech before I get into the message this morning. Good evening. Just moments ago, I spoke with George W. Bush and congratulated him on becoming the 43rd president of the United States. And I promised him that I wouldn't call him back this time. I offered to meet with him as soon as possible so that we can start to heal the divisions of the campaign and the contest through which we've just passed. Almost a century and a half ago, Senator Stephen Douglas told Abraham Lincoln, who had just defeated him for the presidency, Partisan feeling must yield to patriotism. I'm with you, Mr. President, and God bless you. Well, in that same spirit, I say to President-elect Bush that what remains of partisan rancor must now be put aside, and may God bless his stewardship of this country. Neither he nor I anticipated this long and difficult road. Certainly neither of us wanted it to happen. Yet it came, and now it has ended resolved as it must be resolved through the honored institutions of our democracy. Over the library of one of our great law schools is inscribed the motto, not under man, but under God and law. That's the ruling principle of American freedom, the source of our democratic liberties. I've tried to make it my guide throughout this contest as it has guided America's deliberations of all the complex issues of the past five weeks. Now the U.S. Supreme Court has spoken. Let there be no doubt, while I strongly disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept the finality of this outcome, which will be ratified next Monday in the Electoral College. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. I also accept my responsibility, which I will discharge unconditionally to honor the new president-elect and do everything possible to help him bring Americans together in fulfillment of the great vision that our Declaration of Independence defines and that our Constitution affirms and defends. Let me say how grateful I am to all those who supported me and supported the cause for which we have fought. Tipper and I feel a deep gratitude to Joe and Hadassah Lieberman, who brought passion and high purpose to our partnership and open new doors, not just for our campaign, but for our country. This has been an extraordinary election. 
But in one of God's unforeseen paths, this belatedly broken impasse can point us all to a new common ground, for its very closeness can serve to remind us that we are one people with a shared history and a shared destiny. Indeed, that history gives us many examples of contests as hotly debated as fiercely fought with their own challenges to the popular will. Other disputes have dragged on for weeks before reaching resolution. And each time, both the victor and the vanquished have accepted the result peacefully and in a spirit of reconciliation. So let it be with us. I know that many of my supporters are disappointed. I am too. But our disappointment must be overcome by our love of country. And I say to our fellow members of the world community, let no one see this contest as a sign of American weakness. The strength of American democracy is shown most clearly through the difficulties it can overcome. Some have expressed concern that the unusual nature of this election might hamper the next president in the conduct of his office. I do not believe it need be so. President-elect Bush inherits a nation whose citizens will be ready to assist him in the conduct of his large responsibilities. I personally will be at his disposal, and I call on all Americans. I particularly urge all who stood with us to unite behind our next president. This is America. Just as we fight hard when the stakes are high, we close ranks and come together when the contest is done. And while there will be time enough to debate our continuing differences, now is the time to recognize that that which unites us is greater than that which divides us. 20 years ago, we won't see that movie again. Or maybe we will. Isn't it amazing how things have changed in 20 years? Recently, a friend of mine asked me, how are we going to fix the coronavirus problem? How are we going to separate politics from the virus? And, and by the way, the virus is real. Of course it is. But I think we can all agree on one thing, and of course the topic of my message is why can't we be friends? I think we can all agree on this, that although the virus is real, politics are kind of in there a little bit. And so I said, here's my fantasy. Here's what I thought could have fixed things quicker or certainly helped us through it. Back in April, remember, way back in April when uh, President Trump said we're going to shut down for two weeks to flatten the curve, that was way back in April, I would have liked to have seen, this is just my, my thinking, my answer to that question, I would have liked to have seen President Trump, Speaker Pelosi, Majority Senate Leader Mitch McConnell, Minority Senator, Senate Leader Chuck Schumer, appear on national TV right when that thing was issued, I would have liked to have heard them say, we don't like each other. We don't agree with each other. We don't want each other to be reelected in November. We are being honest with you, the, you, the citizens of the United States of America. We want Trump defeated. We want Pelosi defeated. But the election in November will settle that. So here's what we want to say to you, citizens of the United States of America. We agree on this. We're all Americans. And we're going to set aside our political issues for a time to work together to get our country through this. I would have liked to have seen that. As they say, that ain't going to happen anytime soon. Because, see, our elected officials, remember, they're not elected to speak their own voices. They're elected to, to represent us. Our elected officials from both sides of the aisle simply refuse to try to find common ground. They refuse to work together. They refuse to accept perspectives on the other side. They refuse to work together to find common ground. They refuse. So guess what? Billy Graham said it best. Billy Graham, the famous evangelist, he was the, the pastor to many Republican presidents. He was the pastor to many Democratic presidents. And he said it this way. I love it. He said, I'm not for the left wing. I'm not for the right wing. I'm for the whole bird. 
I like that. But here's where I'm going this morning, friends. Since the government will not work together, it's on us. It's on us. The church of Jesus Christ needs to lead the way. The, the church of Jesus Christ needs to set the example, but it won't be easy. Oh, we're in a battle. The enemy wants us divided. Here's something to consider this morning. In this room, good, God-fearing people, you may think that you are absolutely correct on some social issue. Pick the issue. You may think that you're correct. Guess what? There are good, godly people here this morning on that same social issue that disagree with you. But God loves you both all the same. Unless we embrace the fact that we look at things differently, unless we embrace the fact that our life experiences have formed perspectives in our minds and how we look at things, but that's okay because, see, we're not here to discuss who's right or wrong. We need to treat each other with respect and civility, whether we agree or disagree, unless we embrace the fact that we have different perspectives, we could be heading for civil war. I never thought I'd say that. But I have faith in Jesus. I have faith in the body of Christ. Huh. Be careful, church. Be careful. There are folks here this morning in the church, good godly people, but what the church does sometimes is See, when we interpret the words of Jesus through our political filter, oh, it's amazing how often he agrees with us. <laughs> Chew on that one for a while. We need to accept each other. We need to learn from each other. We need to find common ground. We need to love each other. We need to forgive each other. In a week or two, the leaves will be turning, right? And it's beautiful. See, we're created to be different, but it's beautiful. That's how God created us. How boring would it be if we had nothing but green leaves forever? But we need to learn to enjoy the beauty of our differences, no matter what our perspectives are. Okay. Obamacare. There are people in this room, good, God-fearing people in this room that would say, how in the world can you support Obamacare? It's socialized medicine. That's wrong. How can you, how can you support that? Good, God-fearing people would say, but wait, that's your perspective, honey. Because there's other people in the room that would say, good God-fearing people in the room that would say, no, no, how can you not support socialized medicine? The poor need medicine. Who's right? Who's wrong? I'm not here to discuss that this morning. I'm simply saying we have to treat each other with respect and dignity. Can I get an amen? Guns. There are good God-fearing people in the room here this morning that say, how in the world can we have guns in the hands of people when there's violence all over? People are getting killed. Take a look at the news. Chicago, there's violence. and People are getting killed. We got to get rid of the guns. Okay. It's your perspective. Because there's other people here that are pro-gun, and they would say, good God-fearing people, and they would say, no, it's my Second Amendment right. Who's right? Who's wrong? Not here to discuss that today. We just need to treat each other with dignity and respect. I should stop now, but <laughs> if you're a Republican, you're a racist. If you vote for Trump, you're a racist. Oh, but if you vote for Biden, you're a left-wing liberal. I'm going to vote for Biden. Oh, you must not like America. 
Since when did we get to a point in the United States of America, the greatest country in the world, that we can't even say who we're going to vote for without being viciously attacked? When did that happen? On both sides of the aisle. We need to understand perspective. All right, here we go. Acts 2, great event, great event. The day of Pentecost, read about it. Acts 2, Hall of Fame chapter, go there someday. The day of Pentecost, Jesus dies, Jesus is crucified, Jesus, he, he, he rises from the dead. He hangs out for about 40 days and appears to a lot of people. And then he goes back to be in heaven with his father where he's at the right hand of the father interceding for you and I. And then there's this group of disciples and believers. I don't, I, I should have checked it, but I think 120 of them or so were, were around or uh, like that. And they're waiting. What's the next move? What's the next move? And then boom, they're in a room together and, uh, and there's a rushing wind and the Holy Spirit fills that place. And the Bible says they had tongues of fire on their, on their heads. And the Bible says that they were so filled with the Spirit, they were walking around like they were drunk. And, and, and then they start speaking in different languages. And then Peter, you know Peter, right? He was a part of that group. Peter goes out into the streets and he preaches the mother of all sermons. 3,000 people get saved. 3,000 people get baptized. But there's just one problem. They're all Jews. See, Peter and the disciples are going to find out very, very soon that God didn't create heaven just for the Jews. God gave us Jesus for the world. Jesus once said to the Jews, stop being separate. Stop being exclusive. He's saying that to us this morning. Are you listening? I hope we're all listening. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to, to Acts 10. If you don't, that's okay. We'll put it up on the screen here. Acts 10, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna meet a guy named Cornelius. Now, Cornelius is a Gentile. He's a non-Jew. Oh, he's worse than a non-Jew. He's a Roman officer. <laughs> the Jews hated the Romans and they look down on the Gentiles. And so we begin this story. I'm going to read two verses in Acts 10, Acts 1 and 2. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman officer named Cornelius, who was a, a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. I want to say that again. He was a devout, God-fearing man, as was everyone in his household. He gave generously to the poor and he prayed regularly to God. Hey, Cornelius was a good man. He was a good guy. He was, he was a godly man. Now, now, his perspective, though, was centered in Old Testament theology. He didn't know Jesus yet. But in Acts 10, he has a dream. And in the dream, God tells Cornelius that you're going to meet a man named Peter. I'm going to send a guy named Peter to you, and your life will be changed. Now, at the time Acts 10 was written, the church is, I don't know, 8 or 9 or 10 years old. Now, they'll think about this for a minute. Let's say 8 years old. The church is 8 years old when this story was written. 8 years earlier, 3,000 Jews get saved, right? Now we're 8 years later, guess what? The church is comprised of 100% Jews. Talk about prejudice. Let's see what happens to Peter. Acts 10, verses 9 through 16. Here's the story of Peter. The next day, as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Cornelius sent three guys to find Peter after his dream, and that's what is going on here. Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon. He was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He had a dream. He saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its corners, and in the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. And then a voice said to him, 
Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. I love verse 14. No, Lord. Pop, 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 pop. I could just see him with his book of the law tucked under his arm. I love Peter, by the way, but this is so funny to me. No, Lord, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure and unclean. But the boy spoke again. Do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, and then the sheet was suddenly pulled up. This is a great story. See, Peter has this same vision three times, and in his mind, it's a crazy vision. Like, what in the world is that all about? And then all of a sudden, there's a knock on the door while he's trying to figure this out, and it's the three guys that Cornelius sent. And they say, you need to come to our master's house. You got to come. He had a dream. You need to come. And guess what? Peter went. You know why? Because God had already spoken to him in that dream. And so Peter goes to the house of a Gentile. What did he see? He saw a bunch of ham-eating, uncircumcised Gentiles in that house. I, I tell you, Peter must have had an OMG moment there. I'm surprised he didn't have a heart attack. But see, Peter now understands. Are you with me? He understands the vision. He understands now that God doesn't show favoritism. And so you know what he does? He preaches Jesus to these Gentiles. And lo and behold, they get tongues on their heads. And, and they get filled with the Spirit. And they're drunk in the Spirit. And they start speaking in different languages. Just like the day of Pentecost eight years earlier. The Gentiles have the same experience. So what do we learn from Acts 10? I, I just briefly, because we have something really special coming up over here, I just want to briefly give us three lessons that we learn from Acts 10. And the first lesson is this, and this is going to help us understand and appreciate perspectives. The first lesson is this. God does not show favoritism. Peter believed that the Jews were his favorite. He was wrong. God doesn't show favoritism. Let me break it down to you this way. God loves the Muslims. He loves the Mormons. He loves the Christians. He loves the Baptists. He loves the Pentecostals. He loves the Jehovah Witnesses. He loves the Republicans. He loves the Democrats. He loves the Communists. He loves the Socialists. He loves us all the same. Now... Let me just put a little caveat on there. If you've been around me for about the last three and a half years here, I always preach the fact that this is a grace-filled place. Aren't you glad we've been, it been extended, those of us who are lost in sin have been extended the grace of God that comes when we know Jesus as our Savior. So let me say this to you. If you know Jesus, there's a special grace for us. I want to separate that. Yet... He loves us all. Are you understanding? Oh, he loves the Fox News broadcasters. <laughs> and he loves the CNN news broadcasters. And he loves them all the same. He loves President Clinton, and he loves President Bush, and he loves President Palmer, and he loves President Bartlett. Oh, I think I want to make sure you're paying attention. I think... I think Palmer was on 24, and Bartlett was on the West Wing, right? Well, I love the actors that played them. Let me start over. God loves President Clinton. He loves President Bush. He loves President Obama. He loves President Trump. He loves them all the same. When I was lost in sin, when you were lost in sin, when we failed over and over and over and over again, he still loved us no matter what. Lesson number one, God doesn't show favoritism. Lesson number two, God realizes, and we need to realize that we all have preconceived biases. What does that mean? It means we're all prejudiced in some way. Some, sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. I understand that. But we're all 
prejudice. Peter was prejudiced against the Gentiles. Not deliberately, he was raised that way. So he meets this guy named Cornelius, and miracles happen. You would have thought, right, that Peter would have gone out and made it his life mission to do nothing but bring Gentiles to Jesus. But no, Peter slept off the miracle, and he went back to Jerusalem, and he continued hanging out with his religious, prejudiced Jewish friends. That's what happened. That's what he did. And then Paul, the greatest missionary that ever lived, met Peter, went to Jerusalem. Read about it. Don't have time to go there. Read it. He goes to Jerusalem. He confronts Peter. He says, you're wrong on this. You're wrong. We are all the same, neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Paul said to Peter, we're all one in Jesus Christ. We all have a bias, but we need to admit it. That's how we get healed. Third lesson. I love this one. We need to try to understand where others are coming from before we judge them. We need to try to understand, try to imagine what it's like being them. Uh, can I get an amen? Amen. Jackie Robinson, 1947. He became the first black man to play professional baseball. Courageous. He opened the doors for all black athletes to play, to play professional sports eventually. Jackie Robinson played for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He was booed mercilessly. He endured unbelievable inhuman abuse Everywhere he went. And one day, the Brooklyn Dodgers were playing a team from a very racist southern town. And you know what was going on. The words were being said. The word that doesn't belong in any language was being taunted. He was taunted with it. The crowd was going crazy, abusing him. And then Jackie Robinson's teammate. Pee Wee Reese had had enough. Pee Wee Reese, the shortstop of the Brooklyn Dodgers, was a white man from the South. He called timeout. He went over to Jackie Robinson. He put his arm around him in front of the whole crowd. He whispered encouragement to Jackie Robinson. The crowd got quiet. The game went on. Jackie Robinson later said that embrace saved my career. In order for us to heal, we need to think about what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes in order for us to heal. Sometimes it's about going up to somebody who's different than you and just giving them a kind word. Sometimes it's about going up to somebody who's, who's different than you and has a different perspective on life than you and just say, listen, I want to know what you're going through. In order for us to heal, sometimes it's about going up to, to somebody and saying, I want to understand your experiences in life. That's how we heal. We can disagree. We can have different opinions. We can have different perspectives. We're all different. We need to celebrate that. And we need to realize that no matter what side we're on, we have to treat each other with respect and dignity. Maybe we should ask the question, what's it like being black today in America? Maybe we should ask the question, what's it like being white today in America? It's crazy times. Crazy. Friends, hear me. The church must be a place of racial equality. The church must be a place of gender equality. Equality. The church must be a place, yes, even of political equality. There's no place in the church to bash any president. I'm not saying that we can't have good discussions. I'm not saying that we can't disagree. 
But the church is not a place to bash our leaders. The Bible says, 1 Timothy 2, verse 2, pray for those in authority. Don't bash them so we can live peaceful and quiet lives. We need to be praying, not bashing. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ according to Acts 10. Almost 60 years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. It was a great speech, if not the greatest speech ever given. You know the dream speech. I have a dream. I have a dream. You know what he said. It's so sad today, though, that in the year 2020, we're not farther along when it comes to Dr. Martin Luther King's dream. So sad. That speech wasn't popular when Dr. King gave it. Not everywhere, at least. It wasn't popular, especially in some areas of the country, if you know what I'm saying. As a matter of fact, many people think that that, that, that some people put in motion his eventual assassination in 1968 because of that dream speech. A few thousand years ago, though, another preacher gave a message. He wasn't black and he wasn't white. He was brown. His skin was more brown than, than anything else. He, he grew up in Nazareth. He grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. His family was poor. His father's name wasn't on his birth certificate. And he was the object of ridicule and scorn his whole life. And then at the age of 30, he begins his ministry. Gets up in his hometown, goes to the hometown church. He gets up and he, he preaches his first sermon in, in the hometown. Here's, here's a few, few things from his first sermon. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. That's a portion. Sounds very similar to Dr. King's message. I think they were on the same page. Oh, after he was done, though, he, he closes the scroll because he was reading from a scroll. It was Isaiah. And he says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And the crowd tried to kill him too. Eventually they succeeded, but only for a moment. Jesus was preaching something radical, wasn't he? Dr. King was preaching something radical. The message was radical when Jesus preached it. The message was radical when Dr. King preached it in 1963. And the message is radical today. Are you listening? Are you listening to the message? Is our hearts this morning, we're going to embrace that radical message, the church. Are we going to embrace it? What, what was the radical message? Let me break it down to you. This is a little mixture of what Jesus and Dr. King were saying. What was that message? It's pretty simple. Love your enemies. Pray for those that persecute you. Pray for them. Love and accept your neighbor, even if they vote differently, even if they look differently, even if they, they, they think differently. Love your neighbor, accept your neighbor, even if their skin color is different. Love and accept your neighbor, even if they have different perspectives than you do. That's the radical message. That's radical? Really? Since when did it become radical to be respectful? Let me close this way. Matthew James, why don't you come on up? Take a seat over there. Matthew James, one of our main elders. We all enjoy it when Matthew teaches. Joe Lopez, pastor of our Hispanic church, our Hispanic ministry, come on up, take a seat. I want to I wanna ask Dee Wilson to come up. 
my, my new friend. God, I love this guy. Go ahead and go to the piano, D. If you, if you don't know D. Wilson, he's a well-known gospel artist. He's a well-known songwriter, well-known worship leader. And he's going to close the meeting in a few meetings, a service rather. He's going to close the service in a few minutes with a song that, that he wrote about the times that we live in called the medicine. As a matter of fact, Dee's dear wife, Jen Wilson, will be here in a few weeks, I think, right? Thank you, Dee. The day before Jesus died, he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus demonstrated to his disciples the true act of humility. He demonstrated to them respect. He demonstrated to them what a servant does. He demonstrated love to them. See, Jesus showed us, the church, by that act, how we should act towards each other. And then he said, because I've washed your feet, he said to the disciples, so you need to wash each other's feet. So this morning, uh, you need to get those shoes off, Matthew, because <laughs> I ain't washing your, your shoes. <laughs> So this morning, Matthew, I want to wash your feet this morning. I want to wash your feet as an act of love for you, for the body of Christ. I want to, act, I want to wash your feet as, a, as an act of service, as an act of humility, as an act of respect. And as I wash your feet, I want to say to you, would you join me in working hard for unity in this nation and unity in the body of Christ? Joe, in that same spirit, I want to wash your feet. I want to wash your feet as a reminder of the mercies of Jesus Christ, the fact that he laid down his life for us, and that he's commanded us to watch each other's feet. You're clean because Jesus washes your feet. And I want to join my heart with your heart to serve this body, to bring unity to this body and to our communities. In Jesus' name. There's a sickness here that threatens to divide us And we're all afraid to say its name out loud Lord, I know that you can heal us of this virus So we need you, we need you right now And there's a darkness here that's dangerous and aggressive It's getting harder every day to shake its power but Lord, I know that you can free us from oppression. So we need you. We need you right now. Because we don't know what to do. So we'll turn our eyes to you. And we
we've run out of words to say but if you come and have your way would you save us from ourselves before our wounds hurt someone else we need you now what does it mean to have compassion for another how can I claim the love of God that I can't see? If I can find the will to harm and kill my brother Cause he neglected to look like me And I can speak the words of men and songs of angels I can give all my possessions to the poor But if your love can't move the mountains of my hatred Somehow I miss you and I need you so much more Cause I don't know what to do So I'll turn my eyes to you And I've run out of words to say But you can come and have your way Would you save me from myself Before my wounds hurt someone else I need you Cause I don't know what to do So we'll turn our eyes to you And we've run out of words to say God, you can come and have your way Would you save us from ourselves Before our wounds hurt someone else We need you now we need you now. We need you now. We need you right now, Lord. We need you now. We need you now, Lord. We need you now. We need you now. Awaken our conscience, God. We need a miracle. We need you now, oh God. We need a miracle, Lord. A miracle like you did for my mother. A miracle like you did for my great, great, great grandfather. We need you right now. Because if you don't heal us, God will never be healed. And if you don't deliver us, God will never be free. It's if you don't change us, God will never be better. So we need you right now. Need you now. Jesus, we need you. We can't do it on our own. Awaken our conscience, God. Awaken our awareness, God. Mm -hmm. We need you.
Thank you, Dean. Thank you. Thanks for sharing what's inside of you with us. Thanks for sharing what God's given you to the body of Christ. Don't be a stranger. We'd like to see you around every now and then, right? Nicole, are we ready out there? Where is she? Yeah, good. Okay. We're going to be released wedding style. <laughs> One row at a time. But wait, before we do, God has been... God spoke a powerful word today. This was good. This was good stuff. So the issue is we don't want to walk out and sleep it off like Peter did. Because Peter got it later, didn't he? Peter was the rock that the church was built on. Peter got it. In the back, when you're released, it's, it's wedding style. Nicole has a basket with a, 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 a towel. Just as Jesus washed his disciples' feet, we too need to wash each other's feet. Now, because of the virus and, and we follow guidelines, we can't be washing each other's feet this, today, but symbolism is good. If you believe and you buy into and you embrace everything that we said today, take a towel on your way out as a symbol that you too want to be a part of the healing in this nation and in this church. God bless you. Thanks for coming. One row at a time. We'll see you next week.